Good morning and welcome to this edition of ABI's Brunch and Learn webinar series. Uh, just a few housekeeping issues before we get started today. Underneath the PowerPoint presentation you will have a box and that is free for you to enter any questions that you have. Enter the questions as they come to you so you don't forget them. Uh, and Kit will go ahead and respond to those questions at the end of his presentation so we can get the full presentation in first. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank my Omtranet again for all of their technical assistance through this process. Uh, we are going to put these on hold. Uh, as you may or may not know, we are gearing up for our annual conference uh, that takes place June 13th through 15th, so all hands will be on deck for that conference in the coming weeks. So we'll see you back here after the conference. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Kit Cartwright. He is an energy services engineer for Halverson Train, and Halverson Train is located right here in Clive, Iowa. Kit is a certified energy manager, CEM, and a lead accredited professional. He has worked to help clients with energy related matters for over 15 years, grew up in Marshalltown and graduated from, yes, Iowa State University and he's got a degree in mechanical engineering. He's an active member of numerous associations, and I know if you guys are like I am, energy is one of those things that, yeah, 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 we get, but it's important, um, and green is great, but at the end of the day, tell me how I can save some money through that. So I think that's what um, Kit's gonna talk about is being efficient and sustainable all at the same time and finding the benefit to the business owners in doing so. So thank you so much for being here, Kit, yeah, and I'm anxious to see the presentation. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for the introduction. I was going to toot my own horn, but now I don't have to. So. <laughs> um, again, my name is Kit Cartwright. I work for Halverson Train here in Clive. Uh, I've been an energy services engineer for the last two, uh, two, three years, and before that I was in the new equipment, uh, new services uh, aspect of the business. So I've been around energy and energy efficiency uh, for quite a long time. Um, we put this, this presentation together simply to try to get the message across of why is it important uh, for businesses to maybe try to take a look at things like energy efficiency and sustainability uh, from a business solution as opposed to this, uh, uh, this green initiative that maybe doesn't make a lot of sense to people from a financial aspect. Um, so basically we put this presentation together uh, as far as what other businesses may be looking at when they're looking at energy efficiency and sustainability. Uh, so let's jump right in. What we've done is we've identified four major reasons that uh, businesses um, might look at energy efficiency and sustainability. First one is financial impact. Obviously, that is the number one driver for most businesses. If it doesn't make sense uh, from a financial standpoint, then it doesn't make sense to do anything. Um, there's also the aspect of a security uh, of uh, risk avoidance type of a uh, a solution. If you can find a way to reduce your risk in business, um, maybe it's worthwhile spending some money to, to address that. Some businesses also have a, an environmental component to what they do as far as their mission statement, um, looking towards uh, doing good for Mother Earth and that sort of thing, and that's all good. Uh, but we found that that is an additional driver for some uh, businesses to try, to try to pursue that aspect. Uh, another one that a lot of businesses aren't aware of is the differentiation that their business can get by marketing uh, their energy efficiency and sustainability efforts, and we'll get into that here in a minute. And by the way, uh, if you have questions, feel free to submit them whenever they pop in your mind, and what I'd like to do is just get through the presentation. At the end, I'll address all the questions, and uh, I'll have my email address and my LinkedIn contact. If something pops up in the meantime and you just want to send me a note, I'd be happy to respond to it anytime. Yeah. Moving on. Financial impact is the first thing we're going to hit on. This is the number one driver for most businesses to look at um, energy efficiency and sustainability. And the number one uh, reason that we found for businesses to look at it is the positive effect on cash flow. As you know, in any big business or any business in general, cash flow is king. Uh, if you can't maintain cash flow, you're probably going to have a tough time staying in business, and any improvement uh, to a positive cash flow is going to ref reflect positively on the business itself. Every business pays for energy usage in, in one form or another, whether it's uh, keeping people comfortable, keeping the uh, uh, manufacturing side of things going, keeping the lighting levels adequate for productivity. Um, 
what people don't understand or what mo most businesses do not understand is that energy efficiency or energy is a controllable expense. It may not be the biggest expense, but it is a controllable expense, which means um, you can actually do something about it. Um, I'd like to touch on something real quick here as, as far as what we've seen some confusion over. Um, there are two terms out there that are pretty common. One is energy efficiency, the other one is energy um, sustainability or energy um, conservation. Energy efficiency is something that basically doing what you want to do in a business, doing what you need to do in a business, and doing it more effectively. Basically doing the same thing, not affecting people's comfort, not affecting the lighting level, not affecting the reliability of your equipment, but doing that same process but using less energy. That is the definition of energy efficiency. Energy conservation, on the other hand, is living with less. Uh, by trying to save energy, somebody might turn down the thermostat in their office or in their house or shut the lights off or shut the computers off. That's all good and that will save energy at little cost, but um, you have to sacrifice something to get there. So just wanted to try to clarify the, the difference between those two aspects of, of energy efficiency versus energy conservation. Most people, when they think of energy efficiency, think that i got to turn down my stuff. i got to shut the lights off. That's not exactly the case. If you do things in an efficient manner, you shouldn't have to sacrifice what you want. Um, by doing a comprehensive energy and financial analysis, uh, you should be able to find improved cash flow in, in just by, just by you know, analyzing this type of thing. Um, the bottom line is that if you do a comprehensive energy-based uh, improvement, you should be able to see an improved cash flow. The energy saved should offset the financial aspect or the financing costs, uh, and that's kind of indicated on this uh, chart here where you've got the before and after. The unrealized annual savings is uh, the amount of money you're essentially wasting. You're doing what you need to do and unbeknownst to anybody in the firm that you're spending more money than you need to spend. You're spending money basically to waste it. You're buying power from the utility company basically to throw it out the window or throw it out the door. By incorporating a energy efficiency type project, you will see realized annual energy savings. Now, there is a cost to doing these types of projects, but with the long-term financing or depending on the payback, it's really uh, the potentials out there for seeing uh, reduced savings and um, improved other you know, outside benefits in getting a better cash flow uh, from that. So let's move on to the next slide here. Uh, next aspect is profitability. Most businesses obviously want to operate at a profit. Um, part of what goes into a business is cost. Uh, as you can see from this chart, you've got annual energy. Now this is blown out of proportion. Probably not going to be half of your annual energy costs are going to be coming from energy, but I wanted to illustrate you know, how the savings actually works. So what this means is that the bottom line is energy costs are bottom line costs. By reducing bottom line costs, that contributes directly to uh, the profit of the organization. Uh, so if you can find a way to save a, a dollar a year, that dollar a year goes right towards profit. And if you have an offset as far as uh, the outlay, not having to pull that directly out of pocket by having that financed over time, uh, you can get the benefit of both having a positive profitability impact and a positive cash flow impact. If, if think about it from a business standpoint, um, from a bottom line savings aspect, if you can save a dollar uh, from the bottom line costs, what does that translate into into having to have additional revenue? Meaning that if you can save a dollar over here, what would the equivalent be in terms of bringing in additional revenue? A lot of times it's you know five to one. Sometimes it's ten to one. It could even be 20 to 25 to 1, depending on the business. So the answer really lies in um, you know, where your business financials look at. Think of it this way. Let's give you an example. Uh, say a company spends about 5% on its annual expense budget on paying for energy. Uh, same company maintains an operating profit of about 10%. Um, by implementing a, comp a comprehensive energy-based improvement, the company could save 20%. 20% energy savings is not... Um, not uncommon. Uh, I think that's something that, that's really worthwhile shooting for without having to spend a lot of money to get there. Bottom line is, if you do the math, crunch the numbers, it's going to result in about a 9% increase in operating profit. Now think about that. What would your company be willing to pay for a 9% increase 
in profit, uh, especially during trying times, economic times like this, without having to fire anybody or uh, change any processes drastically. You're just improving the way you do things. Nothing else as far as, far as processes and that sort of thing change. So just something to kind of consider there. This slide shows the cost of waiting to do something. Uh, most companies, if they don't have energy efficiency as a priority, they're just going to kind of trickle money into it or not really spend any money on it at all. Uh, what this shows you is that if you've got a project sitting in front of you that is going to save you X amount of dollars, um, the difference between implementing that project with financing right away versus trying to save up enough money in the background and then spending that money right away um, will have an effect on cash flow and an effect on the business. Um, what this shows basically is that uh, we're waiting about five years to do a self-finance versus um, uh, immediately implementing the project. Things to take away from this one is that the, impl the immediate implementation never goes uh, cash flow negative. And that goes back to doing your project in a manner where the financing cost is less than the energy being saved. Uh, by waiting, uh, you're just missing out on some time. And the bottom line is that that um, that external finance or that uh, self-financing, the cumulative cash flow never catches up uh, in time to to just doing it right away. Uh, and the bottom line is, the longer you delay, the bigger that gap uh, between overall savings becomes. So, bottom line on this one is just remember it's worthwhile to um, to implement something sooner rather than later if you can do it. Um, it makes a lot of sense. Next, next aspect is the uh, security risk avoidance. Uh, this is something that's becoming more and more prevalent in businesses. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, worry out there, a lot of uncertainty as far as what's going to happen in the markets, what's going to happen with utility costs, uh, what's going to happen with regulation. Energy efficiency and sustainability is a method uh, to help avoid risk. Basically what you're talking about is in every business, every building and every process uh, uses energy consuming uh, equipment. Uh, if that means machinery, lighting, air conditioning, whatever. That, that equipment is critical uh, to producing the goods and services that businesses need to generate revenue and thereby profit. Um, bottom line is that everything that consumes energy has a fixed lifespan. And uh, you know, thinking that your, your equipment is going to last forever is just not realistic. What's going to end up happening is that if no money is spent on, on you know, being proactive on replacing older inefficient equipment, eventually you're going to have an unplanned failure. Unplanned, unplanned failures cost a lot more than replacing something um, in a planned manner. An easy way to do this as part of an energy efficiency retrofit is, is basically piggybacking a risk assessment on the back of an energy and financial analysis. And the way you do that basically is that most major equipment has an industry predictive lifespan. This is published by third party companies, um, you know, non for profit type organizations and they will basically have a list of the predicted lifespan of a particular piece of equipment. What you can do is you can take an inventory of all your major energy using equipment as part of the energy analysis, take that, itemize it, compare it with its predicted lifespan, and you can kind of get a picture about what your risk is going to be in, in the immediate future or in, uh, you know, in the next few years. Rolling that into an energy efficiency project saying that this unit is going bad uh, we've got to do something about it. At the same time as you're addressing an energy efficiency type of a solution, you can knock two birds down with one stone. So the bottom line is that if, when you start looking at energy, energy efficiency type projects, make sure that you address things that directly affect your business and your, your potential for, for um, gaining profit. And that's looking at this, you know, the equipment risk type of thing. Uh, the next aspect is global uh, fossil fuel availability. This is probably something that, you know, when people start talking about fossil fuels and global demand and that sort of thing, you know, a lot of eyes glass over and, and people start to, you know, think about other things. The bottom line here is that this is becoming a very big issue. Um, global demand for fossil fuels is, is growing exponentially. Uh, the bottom line is the United States is a very fossil fuel dependent um, country, you know, all of our businesses, all of our 
uh, power generation. We depend on fossil fuels on a daily basis. Plus external events and politics um, with everything going on in the Middle East, with terrorism, with um, you know not knowing what's going to happen with uh, you know some of those other countries over there. There are some there are some big concerns, and what this all leads to is potential price spikes and fuel availability. From a business standpoint, um, think about how you know how your business may be touched by fossil fuels. You know everything goes into fossil fossil fuels and the derivatives like uh, transporting goods. You know without uh, without available diesel, you couldn't be able to get your goods from A to B. Uh, chemicals. You would be surprised how many chemicals come from fossil fuels. How many chemicals, uh, fossil fuel dependent chemicals, are in your process? Uh, plastics. You know, every plastic comes from oil. If you look around the room uh, right now, you pretty much everything in your line of sight is going to be touched by fossil fuels in one form or another. Electricity. You know, most of our electricity comes from fossil fuels, and I'll get into that here in a minute. But what other businesses have identified is that there could be a perfect storm coming based on these three aspects that may limit the amount of um, available fossil fuels to businesses. And so we have to take steps to try to avoid those, those interruptions. This is basically a snapshot of US, U.S. energy consumption and how it looks. And if, essentially what the point here is is that 80% of the U.S. energy consumption comes from fossil fuels. Now, we may think that we're doing a good job on renewables, uh, but when you add up you know, the combined contribution of wind and solar, you're talking about less than 1% of our actual energy consumption. Not a lot. And the point is that, that something happens on uh, in the Middle East where petroleum um, may not be available in its current form, or if new regulation happens where natural gas is being limited or coal uh, is being limited by the government, those two, uh, those aspects are going to have a drastic impact on prices and possibly availability of that type of fuel. So the point of this slide is just to show you that um, we're dependent. We need fossil fuels right now. Going back to worldwide con uh, consumption, uh, two countries in general and among others, uh, two countries stand out from other countries as far as their growth in energy consumption. China and India both have been consuming uh, quite a bit more energy on an annual basis year after year. Obviously, if you look at this, uh, China is, is approaching the U.S.'s annual energy consumption. Uh, China is still far behind, but they're growing. Actually, this is a little bit outdated. Uh, I believe last year, China actually exceeded their energy consumption. Um, they exceeded our energy consumption. So they're already becoming a player for fossil fuels, which is most of where this energy comes from. This slide takes it to the next level and kind of shows you um, the actual growth in consumption. And if you look at the, the chart for China, since 1990, their change in energy, energy consumption has gone up by more than threefold. And so that's three times, 3.5 times the amount of energy consumption in just 20 years. Uh, India is just under three, or three times the amount of energy. Compared with the United States, we're about 15% more than where we were in 1990. Uh, I also put on there the worldwide production of energy. Um, with these two countries growing in their energy consumption so fast, the worldwide energy production has only gone up about 50%. So you can kind of see how this is starting to shape up in terms of a potential issue uh, for competition for these types of fossil fuels because that's where most of this energy is coming from. This shows you uh, another potential problem as far as the potential growth of these, you know, how far can these countries go as far as how much can they actually consume, how, how far can this growth actually go. This shows you in a graphical form as far as how much energy um, each country is consuming per person. And if you add up the number of people in China and India, you're talking you know, 3 billion people, um, no, close to 3 billion. That's, and right now, per capita, neither one of those countries are even close to what the United States or Canada is doing. If you do the math, and if you figure out that um, if China and India were to tomorrow just go up to half of the energy per person, basically every person in China and every person in India uses half the amount of energy that a person in the United States uses, that, that combined effect would be 
Um, both nation, nations would consume four times the amount of energy the United States does, and it would also consume more than 80% of the energy being uh, produced today. So you can see there's a, there's a gorilla in the room, and basically these countries, if they continue to grow uh, from their energy consumption standpoint, they have a huge potential for taking up a big chunk of the fossil fuel market it stands to reason that there could be issues down the road in the near future since China just uh, passed us on their energy consumption. This could be an issue as far as the pricing, uh, supply and demand of China is sucking up most of the fossil fuels, um, the price goes up worldwide. Same thing for um, you know, petroleum, same thing for coal, same thing for natural gas. All of it is, is become a global market, not necessarily centered in the United States. It's, it's, it's beyond us now. So. Just something to be aware of, and this is what business, businesses are looking at when they say this is something we have to address. This is something I threw in there just to kind of give you an idea about where we stand in Iowa uh, from a fossil fuel consumption standpoint. If you look at this, this is from the EIA. This is the uh, organization that basically tracks this type of thing. This is based on you know the most current, 2009 is the most current data that we have. 73% of our energy comes from coal. If new regulations come down that limit, you know, coal-fired power plants from doing their job, that will have a direct on effect on price, which means we have to convert over to natural gas. We're going to have to do other things that are going to cost money. Guess who gets to pay for that? That's not going to be the taxpayers so much. It's going to be businesses. It's going to be individuals on their energy bills. So, to make you aware of where this is coming from, right now Iowa is heavily dependent on on coal, uh, and coal is being targeted by the EPA as a, uh, I don't want to say a hazardous material, but basically uh, EPA is trying to crack down on the emissions from coal-fired power plants. You're already starting to see that in energy, increased energy rates from Mid-American Alliance uh, municipals. We believe that's something that's going to continue. Oh, and by the way, um, renewables, Iowa is pretty good. Uh, we're about 16% of our energy coming from renewables. Even said, we're the number two wind energy provider in the country or wind energy generator in the country. And that only accounts for about 16% of our power. So obviously we've got a long way to go and, and the, uh, um, you know, the uh, um, dependency on, on fossil fuels is there. Environmental impact, this is something that's a little bit more intangible uh, from a business standpoint. You know, people can look at where, um, where our CO2 emissions come from, which is what typically uh, global warming is based on, is CO2 emissions. Electricity generation from coal is your number one, which makes sense that the EPA is going after that. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that businesses that revolve around environmental solutions um, want to appear environmental. They want to do something good for the environment, and reducing the CO2 emissions is going to be a driver. Um, again, reduced energy usage, it goes back to the power plant. If you can reduce a kilowatt of electricity, um, that's going to equate to fossil fuel savings at the power plant. Uh, you're also going to equate to reduced pollutants, uh, air pollutants from the power plant, water pollutants from process, uh, sound pollutants. If you've got a, uh, a loud um, type of, a, a, say, a, an outdoor air handler or a cooling, uh, cooling tower sitting next to a uh, residential building, that's that's considered sound pollutants. So that's part of the aspect of, uh, of reducing the environmental footprint as well. Light pollution. I mean, if you take a picture of the United States from space, you can tell, you know, how much the United States is actually illuminated. The question is how much of that has to be illuminated, you know, in the middle of the night when nobody's around. So the fourth aspect is marketing differentiation. This is something that's very interesting from a business aspect, and it's definitely changed over the last 10, 15 years. Um, basically, what we're seeing is that businesses are learning that if they do uh, environmental or energy-based projects, they can actually increase interest from green-minded recruits, clients, and investors. And most of you probably have seen the issues as far as trying to recruit talent. Um, what we're finding is that a lot of talent out there is going to give preferential treatment to businesses that come across as green-minded or environmentally sound. Um, 
Same thing with goals with clients. You may be able to tap into a, uh, a group of clients you never would have tapped into before because they thought you were a polluting uh, entity. Well, all it really takes is marketing uh, your efforts. Uh, announce your project improvements, announce your results, set goals, announce your progress towards hitting those goals. Um, a lot of companies, even though they don't really do anything different on a product, because they come across as a green-minded company, they maybe will generate even a, a premium for their offering, you know, for the product or, or service. So marketing differentiation is something that's new, but it takes a little bit extra effort over just doing an energy efficiency project. So after all that, you may be asking, okay, that sounds good and it, and it makes sense. Where do we even begin on this thing? I mean, when people think about energy efficiency, normally you're just thinking that uh, uh, it sounds good. If you'd like to do it, is it you know is it worth our business time? Probably not. Well, this is going to kind of give you a step by step um, you know order as far as what you can do to try to implement these types of things and start making differences in your business right away. First thing you have to do is discover how your building actually performs. Uh, you're probably tracking uh, energy costs. You're probably not tracking energy usage in terms of uh, real time usage. Uh, start tracking those types of things. Figure out how your building actually performs. You can't set a goal. You can't set a benchmark. You can't compare yourself to how you're doing if you don't know where you're starting. So figure out where you're starting. Figure out what energy you're using per square foot. Make it make it uh, comparable to other buildings, other processes. That way you can establish uh, performance benchmarks. In production facilities, if you can establish a way to equate energy to cost Per widget or pot, per, you know, per unit of production, um, that's a good way to, to indicate exactly how well you're doing. If it takes more energy to, to generate the same amount of widget, well, that's costing you more money. Um, so that's step number one. Step number two is establish an energy plan. It's in your best interest to partner with somebody who knows how to do this. If you have somebody on staff that can do it, that's great. Um, but if there's a third-party company that does this for a living, um, you want to hire somebody that is willing to take responsibility for the estimates that they give you. If somebody turns over a report saying, oh, if you do this, this, and this, you're going to save this amount of money, and here's what it's going to cost to do you, good luck, take care, I'll see you later, there's not a whole lot of buy-in from that company to actually produce what they say they're going to produce. If you have a company that gives you that report and says, we would like to take the responsibility of implementing this and proving it to you uh, on an ongoing basis, that makes a lot of sense. You're not going to pay a lot of uh, an extra premium for that type of service. You're probably just going to see the upside. There's not going to be any surprises, and if there are, you have a partner that's going to have to take responsibility for that. Set a realistic reduction goal. Once you work, start working with a partner to come up with a, a plan, uh, you want to set a realistic goal. If you set your bar way too high, um, the plan may not come to fruition or it may cost too much. It may get pushed back, it may, you know, it may get shot down. Set a realistic goal. The other thing is that when you set a realistic goal, you're going to know up front that this is probably going to happen. 99% sure if you've got a, a partner in, engaged who's going to take responsibility for making it happen. Um, you want to advertise that goal to all employees and prospective clients to maximize that, um, that aspect of the marketing differentiation. Um, you got to advertise, you got to get out, and if you advertise to employees, you're going to get employee engagement as well. Uh, they may start doing those things that, like energy conservation where they shut off their lights or, you know, come to work with a code if they're cold or, you know, do those things that they don't need to do, but that's going to contribute to the bottom line savings. So you may be able to take advantage of that. Uh, the fourth thing is advertise successes, you know, and meeting those goals. The beauty about this thing is you're kind of playing with a loaded deck of cards. If you have a, if you have a, uh, a plan in front of you that the plan is going to say we're going to save 20 percent on our energy that's a pretty good place to start your goal because you already know how to get there and the chances of you not meeting that goal are pretty slim um, so if you set a goal up front advertise that we're going to save 20 percent on our energy bills and then advertise when you meet that goal that's going to bring in uh, employee buy-in people are going to go wow this company actually knows what they're doing they they hit their goal and they hit it in record time um, also, you could you could change it to um, trying to draw some of those green-minded folks in by saying we, we save this amount of energy, maybe not so much in the form of money, but we save this amount of energy, which is equivalent to planting this many trees or getting this many cars off the road, putting that intangible uh, green-minded side to work for you. So 
the beauty of all this is, is that you can have your cake and eat it too. You can have a project that improves, improves cash flow. You can have a project that in, in, improves uh, profitability. You can have a project that reduces risk. You can have a project that, that brings in um, maybe potential clients and talent that you might not have access to. And it's all under the guise of energy efficiency and sustainability. So the bottom line here is that if you do decide to do a project, make sure that there is a component to ongoing monitoring and ongoing um, uh, maintenance on the changes that you make. If you just do a project one and done and then just let it float, what will end up happening is that slowly but surely your energy will go back up to where you start. Um, and and it's, it's nobody's fault, it just happens that way. It's, it's human behavior. If something's not monitored and tracked, um, there's a good chance that it's just going to go away. So with that said, uh, that's pretty much all I've got. Record time, 9.31. I apologize if I was talking too fast. I had uh, you know, six cups of coffee this morning, so that's how I've taken up that. So if there's any questions, uh, that's all I've got for right now. I don't see any questions popping up. I'll just sit here and drink my water while you <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Great information. I uh, appreciate it. And I think a lot of us took some really good things away from that. So thank you. Uh, just a reminder, the ABI conference coming up June 13th through 15th. Lots of opportunities to sort of uh, attend this conference cafeteria style. Uh, we've got a great golf event that's beginning the uh, conference. It'll be at Wakanda Club. There are still a few uh, slots available. So if you are interested in golfing, uh, go to the website and registration is available there. The second day, which is Thursday the 14th, is a lot of very targeted programming to any management team uh, in Iowa. And we're going to run three tracks. One's going to be on HR, one on leadership, and then the third on marketing. And we figured that those are three issues that every company has to take a strategic view on and would benefit from that programming. So that is Thursday. There is pricing available just for that technical information on Thursday. We encourage uh, not only the, the president or CEO of a company to attend, but also that management team that thinks critically and strategically about the company's well-being. And then uh, the third day, which is Friday, and sort of the cherry on top of the conference uh, is uh, double whammy of uh, Jim Collins, who is the author of Good to Great and the newly released Great by Choice, both great reads. Uh, and then we've got Gina Wickman, who's the lead-in speaker for Jim Collins. And a lot of Gina Wickman fans say that uh, his information and strategic approach to leadership within a company is every bit as valuable as Jim Collins. So. We do encourage you, and again, there are public tickets available for just that session, uh, really economically priced. So we encourage you to not only come yourself, but bring your team to uh, the Friday, the 15th uh, part of the conference. And again, we're taking a little bit of a break here uh, from the webinars, and we will be seeing you, I think, the end of June is our next one. So Look forward to seeing you then. Uh, take care, and thanks a bunch, Kit, for the information. Thanks Hope for having you. me. I really appreciate it.